Hello everyone, my name is Zenobia. Today I will be talking about some key anatomical structures of neck, like fascias of the neck, cervical plexus, carotid sheet, and external carotid artery. My aim is to make it as easy as possible, so sit back and enjoy the video. Let's start with the fascias of the neck. A fascia is a sheet of connective tissue beneath the skin that attaches, stabilizes, encloses, and separates muscles and organs. Neck fascias are divided into superficial and deep. Superficial cervical fascia is located between dermis and deep cervical fascia, containing neurovascular supply to skin, superficial veins, superficial lymph nodes, fat, and platysma. Deep cervical fascias are further divided into three different fascias. Investing layer of the cervical fascia, also called superficial layer, pretracheal layer of the cervical fascia, also called middle layer, pre-vertebral layer of the cervical fascia, also called deep layer. So in the video, I have kind of simplified it, but preferably use the terms like investing layer, pretracheal, and pre-vertebral. So the investing layer of the cervical fascia encloses all the structures of the neck except the platysma. Moreover, the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the trapezius muscle are embedded within. Next up is pretracheal layer. Uh, it is situated in anterior neck and it spans between the hyoid bone and thorax inferiorly. It encloses the trachea, esophagus, thyroid, infrahyoid muscles. Its posterior aspect is formed by contributions from a bucopharyngeal fascia, which is a fascia that covers um, the pharynx. Lastly, there is pre-vertebral layer, which is a very self-explanatory term. It surrounds the vertebral column and associated muscles like scalenes, pre-vertebral muscles, and deep muscles of the back. Right, so continuing the topic of fascias, let's not forget about the carotid sheath. It is formed thanks to the contributions from pre-tracheal, pre-vertebral, and investing fascias. It is a paired structure which encloses an important neurovascular bundle. So what are the contents of the carotid sheath? It contains internal jugular vein, common carotid artery, internal carotid artery, vagus nerve, and lastly, accompanying cervical nodes, which I am writing right now in the video. So as I'm writing that, let me quickly tell you that uh, common carotid artery at the level of C4 bifurcates into internal and external carotid artery. External carotid artery is not within the sheet. It's because it pierces through it and gives off its branches. However, internal carotid artery continues to ascend within the carotid sheath. That is why you can see two carotids, the common and the internal. One important thing that you need to know is the position of each content. Maybe not the cervical lymph nodes, but the other three really important. So as you can see in the picture, laterally located is the internal jugular vein. Medially located is the common carotid artery or internal carotid artery. And in between them and posteriorly is the vagus nerve. This is the content and the position. If you know this, you will be golden. Moreover, one last thing that I want to add to this is the relation uh, with the carotid sheet. So there are some structures which are in close uh, proximity to the carotid sheet. And uh, we call these the relations or associating structures. One of which is anteriorly and cervicalis which is a part of cervical plexus that we'll be talking about later and posteriorly is a sympathetic trunk. Let's talk about cervical plexus. It might be a lot for you to cram in, but I've tried my best to make it as easy for you as possible. Starting with the definition, cervical plexus is formed by the communication of the anterior rami of the upper four cervical nerves, C1 to C4. That is why C5 is in white because it is not part of the cervical plexus. 
As you can see in the video, the left side is for motor innervation and the right side is for sensory innervation. This is not true in real life, so don't stick to the picture. Um, this is just to make it easier for you. Also remember that cervical plexus is a paired structure, so you are expected to find it on either side of the neck. All right, so C1 gives off two branches. The first branch, as you can see in the picture, it interacts with cranial nerve 12 and the bundle supplies some important muscles of the neck like geniohyoid and thyrohyoid. The second branch, it descends and interacts with the branches coming from C2 and C3. And as you can see, a loop has been formed and some of you might recognize it. It is ansa cervicalis. So the superior root of ansa cervicalis is made by C1 and the inferior root is made by the communication between C2 and C3. This loop innervates three important muscles of the neck, the sternohyoid, sternothyroid and omohyoid muscles. Great. Right, lastly, we have three interactions again. So C3, C4, and C5 contributes to the formation of phrenic nerve, and this innervates the diaphragm. And that's all for our motor innervation by cervical plexus. Moving on to sensory innervation, I have just made it easier by making communication with e within the vertebrae. Um, nothing from C1 to C2, but C2 and C3 communicates to form L-O-G-A-T-C. Now, L-O is lesser occipital, G-A is greater auricular, and T-C is transverse cervicalis. C3 and C4 communicates to form, uh, or to form uh, supraclavicular nerves, and there are three uh, supraclavicular nerves. Uh, easy mnemonic that I use to memorize uh, this is uh, oats o for lesser occipital a is for greater auricular t is for transfer cervicalis and s is for supraclavicular so the white lines that i've drawn is to represent level innervation there is no interaction within the vertebra but each level gives off some innervation or nerves to um, specific muscles of the neck and that detail you can find in my notes. Uh, it was not worth mentioning here because again, it's not part of the cervical plexus. All right, what is what else do you need to know? Cervical plexus uh, and the location, obviously the location is very important. So it lies under a sternocleidomastoid. It rests on levator angulus scapular muscle and scalenus medius. It emerges from the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So if you read the notes while watching this video, it will come in handy because I have a picture in the notes where you can clearly see um, cervical plexus emerging from the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And that's it for the cervical plexus. Finally, let's talk about external carotid artery it is a branch of common carotid artery so the left and right common carotid arteries ascend up the neck lateral to the trachea and the esophagus they itself do not give off any branches until they reaches the region of c4 which is you can also say the level of the superior margin of the thyroid cartilage. At the level of C4, the carotid artery bifurcates into external and internal carotid arteries. It remains within the carotid sheath. However, the external carotid artery eventually uh, pierces through the carotid sheath and gives off its branches, whereas the internal carotid artery continues to ascend within the uh, carotid sheath and this occurs in an anatomical region called the carotid triangle. The external carotid artery is not an easy topic to memorize. Not only there are so many branches but also branches of branches which makes it a very difficult topic. But don't worry about that. Uh, for now, our main focus will be on the main branches. 
Personally, to learn big chunks like this, I like to use demonic and I've mentioned one in the video, which is some anatomists like freaking out poor medical students. It is so relevant and it is so easy to memorize. Um, so if you don't have any of yours, maybe try memorizing it and you will be golden. Right, so the branches. S for superior thyroid artery, ascending pharyngeal artery for A, L for lingual, F for facial, O for occipital, P for posterior auricular, M for maxillary, S for superficial. Like, I cannot even imagine just memorizing the names without having a mnemonic. Also, the mnemonic is in the order of the branch that comes out of the uh, external carotid artery. So don't worry about which is when, where, it is all in order. You can further classify the branches of external carotid artery into anterior, posterior, medial, and terminal. In the previous uh, picture, you saw the terminal branches, but again, it's worth mentioning here and it's worth memorizing because these are the questions that the examiner may ask you out of nowhere. All right, so the anterior branches are the lingual artery, facial artery, superior thyroid artery, Posterior is occipital, posterior auricular, medial is ascending pharyngeal, and terminal is superficial, temporal, and maxillary artery. Let's talk about each branch in a little bit of more detail, starting with the superior thyroid artery. So it is the first branch of the external carotid artery. It originates at the level of hyoid bone or it can also originate very close to the bifurcation point, really depends on the anatomy of a person. It gives off several branches, which are not mentioned in the picture, but I'll quickly tell you. Hyoid artery, sternocleidomastoid branches, superior laryngeal artery, and cricothyroid branch. Main point to remember is that it supplies the larynx and the thyroid gland, and it terminates into the thyroid gland. Next up is the ascending pharyngeal artery. It is the smallest branch of the external carotid artery. It courses vertically with the internal carotid artery and to the side of the pharynx. Uh, it supplies the base of the skull and also terminates at the base of the skull. Lingual artery is the third branch of the external carotid artery. It originates at the level of C3. It courses towards the hyoid bone, then loops down towards the tongue. It supplies the oral floor and the tongue and terminates eventually into the tongue. The facial artery is the fourth branch of the external carotid artery. It supplies blood to the structures of the face. It originates a little above the lingual artery in the carotid triangle of the neck. It passes deep into the posterior belly of the digastric muscle, the stylohyoid muscle, and the submandibular gland. It then continues its tortuous course over the inferior border of the mandible towards the nasolabial fold. Now the branches are divided into cervical and facial. Under the cervical category comes ascending palatine artery, tonsillar branch, submandible submental artery, glandular branches. Under the facial comes inferior labial artery, superior labial artery, and lateral nasal branch. It eventually terminates as angular artery. Occipital artery originates at the level of the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. It ascends posteriorly towards the occiput. It gives off several branches like sternocleidomastoid branch, auricular branch, mastoid branch, descending branches, occipital branches. It eventually terminates on the scalp over occipital bone. For the posterior auricular artery, know that it supplies the auricle and the scalp posterior to the auricle. It originates above digastric and stylohyoid opposite to the styloid process. It ascends beneath the parotid towards the ear. Then it supplies and eventually terminates into the scalp posterior to the auricle. As for the maxillary artery, I will not be talking about it in detail because there's a complete different video made on it. Um, make sure you check it out. Um, 
Also, just know that it supplies the deep structures of the face and it has a lot of branches. Lastly, let's talk about superficial temporal artery. It's one of the two uh, terminal branches of the external carotid artery. It arises in the parotid gland and runs between the deep and superficial lobes and then over the zygomatic arch. There are several named branches together supplying parts of the face and scalp. The terminal branches are the frontal branch, you can also call it anterior branch, and a parietal branch, you can also call it posterior branch. Then there is a transverse facial artery, middle temporal artery, and anterior superior auricular branches or artery. Alright, so that's the end of the topic. I hope it was helpful and uh, good luck for your exams and take care of yourself with all the corona situation going on. I hope you're keeping yourself healthy and staying home. Goodbye.